Big shout out to my friends, Rachel Lindsay and Van Lathan, hosts of the amazing podcast, Higher Learning. Wanted to get this out of the way because I'm also blaming y'all for this week's topic, which represents an increasingly frustrating conversation. So last week on Higher Learning, Van and Rachel got into a robust, healthy debate and discussion about President Joe Biden losing support in the black community, an assertion that has been backed up by recent polls. Here's a sample of their discussion, which was triggered by recent comments made by Texas Representative Jasmine Crockett on CNN. Now, there are some people that uh, have some thoughts about why Joe Biden seems to be losing support amongst Afro-Americans. Here's the deal. Perception is reality. And so when you look at the data that was provided in this poll, it talks about how people feel. And when people decide whether they're going to the poll or whether they're not going to, to the poll, it's all about how you feel in that moment. And so while the facts may not align with their feelings, their feelings are dictating their reality. Their reality is that they said that they feel better or they felt better when Trump was in office. But we've been trying to push back. We've got some very popular African-American artists that are out here saying things like, oh, I got checks when Trump was in office. I want those checks again, not understanding that that really came from Congress. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple of things, the perception issue. And then we also have an issue as it relates to civics in this country and people not understanding exactly how any of this works. Now, Van posted a clip from their discussion on his Instagram page. Van wrote, if you vote for Democrats and they don't deliver, it's not their fault. If you don't vote for Democrats and they don't deliver, it's not their fault. If you're not excited to vote for the Democrats, then you don't understand government. Is there any accountability for the Democratic establishment at all when it comes to black folks? And fuck it, I'm bothered. Not because of Vance Caption or their conversation on higher learning, but because we are on the verge of making the same mistake that we did in 2016 when Donald Trump got elected, letting emotion dictate rather than strategy. The Wall Street Journal had a big story this week with this headline, Biden is losing black voters. Here's why it matters. The story begins with a voter named Michelle Smith, a 46-year-old home health care aide who makes $12.50 an hour and supplements her income by making Instacart deliveries. The article points out how wage gains have dipped for black workers this year. There was a 10.2% gain last year, and this year it's been about 4% even though black employment remains at a record low. And Michelle Smith pointed out the higher cost of living, skyrocketing rent, that these were things she thought Biden could help with. Then she said something that really caught my eye. I think I'm not going to vote, period. Now, since the post Barack Obama election years, more and more black folks aren't showing up to vote. When former President Obama was elected in 2008, the black voter turnout jumped a staggering 21 percentage points from the previous election. In fact, it was the first time in history that black voter turnout exceeded white voter turnout with almost 70% of black people voting. And then in 2012, it was an identical story. The black voter turnout was higher with 67% of African-Americans showing up in the voting booths. Now, it's pretty obvious why black voter turnout was strong. The idea of electing the first black president was electrifying. It was encouraging. It was promising, and not just for black people. 66% of white people polled at the time said electing Obama as president represented significant progress for the country. It felt like maybe, just maybe, some kind of corner was being turned. We got all caught up in the visual of seeing the first black family in the White House. Also, kind of helped that Obama just so happened to be one of the most charismatic politicians in American history. I'm so in love. This is your victory. Now, I know you didn't do this just to win an election. And I know you didn't do it for me. You did it because you understand the enormity of the task that lies ahead. But my main message is, is uh, to the parents of uh, Trayvon Martin. You know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. They had their entire lives ahead of them. Birthdays, graduations, weddings, kids of their own. Among the fallen were also teachers, men and women who devoted their lives to helping our children fulfill their dreams. So our hearts are broken today. It's the idea held by generations of citizens who believe that America is a constant work in progress, who believe that loving this country requires 
requires more than singing its praises or avoiding uncomfortable truths. It requires the occasional disruption. Then came 2016 and Hillary Clinton. Those same emotional factors that drove a historic number of black people to vote wasn't there. The Democratic Party grossly overestimated the support for the Clintons. All those jokes about Bill Clinton being the first black president, Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on the Arsenio Hall show, yeah, that shit was done. And even though Hillary Clinton wasn't president, the fact is the infamous 1994 crime bill was attached to the Clintons and she showed her support for it. A lot of us were like, mm, I'll pass, or rather, I'll stay home. And so for the first time in 20 years, black voter turnout decreased in a presidential election and Donald Trump became president. Now we're a year out from the presidential election and I'm already seeing some of the same danger signs that were there in 2016. People loudly and proudly declaring they ain't voting or that they'll vote for everything but the president or worse, they voting for Donald Trump. Now for those threatening or determined to sit out of next year's presidential election, given what happened as a result of 2016, did black people not showing up to vote as vigorously as they did before actually work? as a strategy? Let's look at the results. With Donald Trump in office, he nearly guided this country straight off a cliff with his pandemic response. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light, and I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that, too. Sounds interesting. We'll the right, folks who could. right. And then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs, and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it would be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with, but it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. And for the billionth time, the stimulus checks happen because of Congress, not because of Donald Trump, who, by the way, held up those checks because he wanted his name to appear on them. Sorry to break the bad news to you, Sexy Red. Also occurring during Trump's presidency, he became the first president in our history to ever be impeached twice. Gave American corporations the biggest tax cuts in the country's history, because, you know, he's all about the working man and woman. Trump also appointed three Supreme Court justices who gutted Roe versus Wade and affirmative action, just as he promised that they would. He also appointed 193 federal judges. And remember, these are lifetime appointments. To give you an idea of the scope of this, there are 816 federal judgeships that comprise the Supreme Court, appellate, and district courts. And in one term, Trump appointed 28% of those positions. Almost 90% of those he appointed were conservative white men. And of course, how could we forget the coup de grace. Literally, his continuous lies about being cheated out of the election prompted that cute little field trip to the Capitol on January 6th. That field trip was just a precursor and an audition of what's to come if we continue to treat voting like something we can just opt in and out of or something that's not important. Listen, I get it. I know that black people are not happy with Joe Biden, but even within those feelings of dissatisfaction, we gotta leave some room for nuance in this discussion because otherwise it would be dangerous not to. I keep reading, hearing so many people say the Democratic Party hasn't done anything for black people or this administration in particular hasn't done anything for black people. And it's frustrating because that's just historically and presently not true. And it's a massive overreaction brought on by our collective frustration. It's like when you get in an argument with your significant other and you tell them that they ain't shit or they don't do shit for you. I mean, sometimes it's probably true, but you're mostly responding out of anger and frustration because the truth is this administration has done some things for black people. There have been three huge pieces of legislation that were passed in Biden's term. The American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. If you're not familiar with these plans, here are the specific ways in which these major pieces of legislation have impacted the black community. The American Rescue Plan, passed in 2021, was a $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. Important note here, every single Republican in the House and Senate voted against this plan. Let me repeat that again. Every single Republican voted against this plan. The American Rescue Plan included direct payments of up to $1,400 to people, an additional $300 in unemployment. 27 billion went to help renters needing emergency assistance. And for further context of that, 
realized that 60% of black people rent their homes. There was also a federal eviction moratorium that lasted well over a year. So I ask you, did that help black people? Also part of the American Rescue Plan, there was the expanded child tax credit, which cut the poverty rate for black children to a record low. There were billions in this bill earmarked for workforce training, which included providing grants to HBCUs and minority serving institutions to create opportunities in cybersecurity. Why? Because there were 700,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs. Speaking of, let's talk about internet access as a whole. 75 billion of this bill was earmarked to provide reliable internet access to Americans. Why is this important to black people? Because approximately 40% of black households did not have internet access. In the rural South alone, 38% of households didn't have broadband. This part of the bill aimed to specifically target urban areas like Detroit and Baltimore. As many of you all know, the lack of quality internet access can have a dramatic impact on job and educational opportunities. Black people make up just 7.4% of the digital workforce. A big reason there is such a big disparity is because we don't have the same access to the internet. And with digital and tech jobs expected to grow by 13% by 2030, I would argue internet access in the black community is pretty important. So again, did the American Rescue Plan help black people? There was the Inflation Reduction Act passed last year. Quick question, how many of y'all know somebody who is on Medicare? More than half of the people on Medicare are minorities. For black people specifically, that number is about 25%. Quick history lesson on the origin story behind Medicare and Medicaid. In 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Medicare and Medicaid Act, which helped those over 65 have health care as well as those from low income households. Uh, let me hmm, let me check my notes here. Uh, it was two Democratic congressmen who helped create Medicare and Medicaid and it was signed into law by a Democratic president. So that would mean Democrats have done something for black people. Anyway, back to the Inflation Reduction Act. Among adults 65 and older, black Medicare recipients were one and a half times more likely to have trouble affording medications. Under the Inflation Reduction Act, a cap was put on the amount seniors paid for prescriptions. So that meant that for a month's supply of insulin, seniors would pay no more than $35. Again, for context, about 12% of black people have diabetes, but among our seniors over 65, that number is roughly 14%. Quick note, black people make up 13% of the population. So again, does a prescription cap help black people or not. Two other big components of the Inflation Reduction Act is creating economic and job opportunities in the energy field, which will be hugely important in the coming years, and specifically giving low-income families valuable tax credits so that they can have access to receiving stove and oven upgrades, replacing air conditioners, water heaters, and other electric appliances. Again, does this help black people? Oh, an important note. <laughs> Every single Republican voted against all these things. Now, I didn't even get into the infrastructure legislation, but quickly, I'll just go over a few points. $600 million investment in fixing dilapidated water structures. That was on top of the $115 million the Biden administration gave to Jackson, Mississippi to help fix his water system. Then there was student loans, which is another big issue in our community. There are 5.5 million borrowers enrolled in Biden's student loan plan, which lowers monthly payments dramatically and caps interest. Already, this administration has created $127 billion in relief for student loan borrowers. But with all that being said, I don't have pom-poms because I ain't a cheerleader. None of these gains mean Black people owe any undying loyalty to the Democratic Party. The biggest reason Black people have aligned themselves with the party the last 50 or 60 years is because for now, that party has been a mechanism for survival, and thus far represented the clearest pathway to us gaining political traction. Now, this isn't to say both parties have not engaged in the spread of white supremacy. They both absolutely have. But currently in this moment, there is one party that has decided their pathway to power runs through white nationalism, voter suppression, and fascist rule. So I'm not telling you vote Democrat or else, or vote blue no matter who, or unless you vote for Joe Biden, you ain't black. I'm telling you now isn't the time to get frustrated and quit. Now is the time for boots on the neck. Now is the time to use the fact that this party cannot win without our support and use that to our advantage and be proactive in our approach. Now, a lot of that starts with us. If you don't know who your council members are, your county commissioners, your district attorneys, your local prosecutors, your state reps, your district reps, your school board presidents, your county sheriffs, 
then you are willingly conceding your power. In Louisiana's recent governor's race, the voter turnout was 36%, with three times the number of white voters voting compared to black folks. And now the same man who only wants to make juvenile records public in Louisiana's primarily black parishes is in power. The same man who threatened to jail abortion providers with a 15-year prison sentence is in power. And he also blocked the clemency for a number of black inmates. That's who's in power. And he's firmly entrenched and promising to do even more damage. A politician politician's greatest superpower is your apathy. When you look at your paycheck and you see the money earmarked for the government every week or every two weeks or whatever your pay period is, in what world did you ever pour money into something and not give a damn about where it goes or who's in charge of it? Let somebody add a tax on your restaurant bill that you don't recognize and you asking for the manager. So why would you ever leave a politician in charge of thousands, millions, or even trillions of dollars and not stay on top of where it goes? No matter the election, you will never get everything that you want. But removing yourself from the democratic process is not a solution. It's not being revolutionary, it's not being bold, and it's not getting you any closer to what you desire. All it is is a cop-out. Because here's the thing, while we sitting around here frustrated and loudly telling people we ain't voting, these people are definitely going to vote. A bomb I had, big part of 9-11. Which part? Not being around, always on vacation, never in the office. Why do you think Barack Obama wasn't in the Oval Office on 9-11? That I don't know. We'd like to get to the bottom of that. We don't even know if he's a citizen. Yeah, if you, if you don't look at the birth certificate, there's almost no evidence there. Exactly. So there's nothing Barack Obama could do to prove that he was born here? Uh, if there was maybe witnesses that were attendants at his birth. Like yeah. his mother? Would you listen to no. his mother? No. No. no, no. She has the motivation to lie. So you don't trust uh, Donald Trump's birth certificate either? Uh, yeah, because he's been here forever. Well, how do you know? But how do you? What's your proof? Um, well, his parents and. But no, but they—they're biased. I'm talking about like people who could Why be. Why would the they be biased? Well, like I'm just using your logic okay. against you. And if you're good with people like that having a bigger say in this government than you, God bless you, because I can't do it. Stay unbothered.